Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to yet another session of the Thoracic Gurus. Uh, it's nice to be back after a few days of holiday, <laughs> and we are very fortunate today to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Sean Kolwaker. Uh, Dr. Sean Kolwaker is a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon. He is a world-renowned authority in uh, in in pectus surgery. Uh, almost uh, all people across the world come to Bath to learn from him. He has published extensively on chest wall surgery. And what a lot of people don't know is he's actively involved in development of uh, new technology. And currently he's working with uh, a company where they are trying to develop uh, uh, assessment of lung functions. And uh, Sham is gonna tell us all about how to assess lung functions uh, in the COVID era before and now. Sham, uh, the audience is uh, uh, is consists it consists of uh, uh, you know exam going students uh, who are taking either FRCS or MCH or DNB. We also have uh, uh, senior surgeons uh, who have logged on onto this uh, uh, channel. Uh, we are also relaying live uh, on the IAX website. You're also live on YouTube, so we've got an audience of about 400 or so who are logging into this lecture. So please tell us all about lung functions in this dangerous times of COVID. Uh, Zamir, thank you very much. You're very kind. And uh, it's happy to see a lot of our colleagues, friends, and trainees around. Uh, I think uh, it all came when I was asking for lung function test. And it was such an upheaval task to get it because it was easier to get a meeting with Donald Trump than getting a lung function done in any lung in, the, in London hospitals because because of the COVID, there is a fear amongst, of course, uh, the technicians at risk, they had to keep putting PPE every patient. So they had to rationalize who gets it, who doesn't get it. And it becomes a, quite a task. So I realized that I worked with this uh, uh, lung function test device, which is called structural light plethysmography for my chest wall. And I thought it's a good opportunity for this because it's quite non touchy But I just thought before I say something about that, I better go through whole lung function barrage, which we go through for our patients, as you know, Zamir, for our cardiac patient, thoracic patients. So without a delay, I, let me start this because, uh, so this is my conflict of interest. I work with, uh, I, have, I have used this Thorac 3DI SLP device, which does the lung functions in my chest wall patients. And also I organize a symposium about it in uh, last Mumbai minimal invasive meeting. Uh, so Can I just interrupt for one sec? I've only got a microscopic um, view of that slide, Shyam. Is there something clever one can do to, to, to blow it up? Uh, I will ask uh, uh, Prof Khan about it. On the you, top you... right, if you swap yeah. share the screen with video, probably. Yeah. It says what? Swap share the screen with video. Look, look in uh, view options. Look in view yeah. options. Yeah. And go into either full screen or fit to size. So mm. at the top, uh, you're viewing Sean Colvis to window. Colvis screen. Yeah, and either you fit it to window or you make it 100% of the size. Sorry, folks. No, that's no good at all, I don't know. All right, anyway, I can see it now just about, thanks. Perfect, okay. So I think lung functions are done uh, like a basal lung functions, we want to know, detect a disease, sometime monitor the progress of the disease, whether it's getting better, like a bronchodilators uh, and cystic fibrosis. It's a good way of evaluating how the patients are doing. And of course, being a surgeon, uh, we like to know how the lungs are, whether they cope up with the resection, they will cope up postoperatively, whether they'll come up with the ventilators. And that's the reason everyone wants to know lung function. The natural lung function tests are done usually with the history, symptoms, and the usual clinical part of it. Then the X-rays can give you chest X-rays, CT scan, VQ scan, and the PET scan, oxygen saturation, arterial blood gas, and then the spirometry and flow volume lung curves. There is a contraindication for this. If you had a recent eye surgery, it's dangerous to do blow the things into spirometer, and that can lead to your issues. If you've got a aneurysms in abdomen and thorax and cerebrum, you may be high risk. Uh, but they need lung function sometimes. 
And if you've got active hemoptysis, you shouldn't be doing the lung function. Also the pneumothorax, if you had a recent myocardial infarction. And now there's a new relative indication, risk of infection to patient and staff, like COVID, uh, MDR, TB, it becomes a relative contraindication. So mechanical uh, uh, ventilatory functions are done for uh, many years. The bedside pulmonary effects are done by everyone. And I can, I'll can i briefly discuss about it when it comes. The static lung volumes, as you know, from vital capacity to functional residual capacity, that can be measured with lung function. And the dynamic ones are very important for us, especially for thoracic surgeons to know how the lungs, when we resect something, how patient will tolerate it. And it's a post-operative. So that's why both part of the lung functions are essential for us to know. And this is a famous curve. When I had a first time, first book of physiology, Samson Wright, we opened up and I saw this diagram. It was quite amazing. I thought I know lung, everything about lung function, but I didn't know nothing at that time. But it tells you about whole lung volume, vital capacity. And this, this is a colorful diagram, gives you a rough idea what we're looking for, what are the values of it, especially the tidal volume and also the residual volume. But I think we can measure most of these with different, different gadget. Not all of them are necessary, but the vital capacity is important. Of course, everyone knows about anatomical dead space, which is between your sort of nose to alveoli, before alveoli, and that's a part of the uh, respiratory tract of no use for ox oxygenation, but it's part of the tube, as you say. But functional dead space is important, and it's usually you have less blood going there, and usually with collapse, you could have that dead space. So bedside lung function. This is a French chap, Shabra says, is a breath holding test. It's wonderful. Now, while you're watching it, you can try to hold your breath. And if you can do it around 30 seconds, you have a normal <laughs> cardiopulmonary health. I don't think you should hold your breath for long, but uh, this is if you can't hold it between sort of 15 to 25 seconds, you've got a limited cardiopulmonary reserve. If it's less than 15 seconds, probably you're not very fit for most of the things. And they got some surrogate results with it. Like if you hold for 30 seconds, you have a vital capacity of around 3.5 liters. These are just sort of derived values, but it's an interesting test to do if you don't have any gadgets. Single breath count is fantastic. You can do it while you're watching. You take a deep breath and start counting. If you count up to 40, you're good to go. Uh, then the Snyder's match blowing test. It's good for smokers. You can smoke a cigarette, put your matchstick and blow it up. If you can blow it up to 90 inches, then your uh, free flow is around up to 150 liters. If you do only for three inches, probably you are not very good at blowing or your lung capacity is low. So this is a sort of bedside test. It comes with all interesting things. The cough test is very good uh, because it, well, when you take a deep breath and a cough, it tells you if it's a wet cough, you know there are some issues with it and you can see your vital capacity and it tells you effectiveness because it's quite difficult to try this if you can cough three times after deep breath. And if it looks up, it's a strength and effectiveness can tell you your lung functions in chest. This is a uh, force expiratory time. This is also bedside where you take a deep exhale and you put a stethoscope on trachea and see how much you are exhaling. It gives you a timing. Like if it's normal timing is around 3.5 seconds. If you take a long to blow it up, you have obstructive lung disease. And that's how it can be diagnosed. And this is a famous thing, everyone has it. And I think if you look at here, this guy is blowing his lungs out in this gadget. The poor nurses are exposed there. In a COVID era, this both could be at risk to give it to one other. So even though it's a, it's a simple uh, disposable thing, but it can be a risk here in some patient, some situation. But uh, peak flow one is very good, you can, see, measure these bed sites, and it is good to assess effect of bronchodilators. And if you have no other tests, you can do that to have a documents in your operation theaters before taking for operation. The peak flow is around 450 to 700 liters per minute in male, uh, in female is around 350 to 500. If you go below 200, it's a quite worrying. This is a lovely 1965, I think, De Bono presented this in Lancet. It's a little whistle. You keep blowing the whistle. And then if you see there are, there are measurements here, 
and you get a sort of peak flow meter, but it's it's a interesting as a whistle. This is a right respirometer. It is one of the gadget we still have. The patient is intubated. You can connect them to, and then you can measure some volumes. Uh, but if you've got a low volume, it's not very sensitive. Of course, the history. Early plethysmography is where you're in a cupboard, and that's Hutchison, uh, who invented a, spir a spirometer in almost 1842. He was probably was a surgeon, and he wanted a, something to assess patients, and he developed this spirometer. Uh, the early plethysmography are like that. There is an animal inside that box, and people are measuring his uh, movements of his lungs. And then the lower one is the one where you do lung function, where you somebody's sitting in the box, and then it's a, uh, you take a deep breathing and expiration, and your chest wall moves by Boyle's law. And there was this carbon drum where you do a graphic interpretation. The spirometer was a different different kind. This is where it's a water and the drum and the little weight you can measure the displacement of a volume. Uh, I think they lead to modern inventions. Microspirometers everyone carries in their cage, most of the chest physicians, and uh, that's good for measuring vital capacity. And of course, pulse oximeter and arterial blood gases. So static lung one, where you do a spirometry, this is the one which we do routinely in our lung labs. Uh, and this is where you get a report. But you see his mouth is very close to this gadget. The technician is observing the both are very close and that is more worrying. This lady should have a PPE and probably he should and there are a lot of restrictions. That made me think about the SLP. Uh, John Hutchison was the inventor as a file, and you could measure the vital capacity and uh, FEV one is one of the interesting one for all of us. But you can't do the uh, functional residual capacity and all you need for that uh, different vehicle, you need inert glasses to measure the remaining of white uh, residual volume. This is a diagram we all see from our physiology book. The green always looks good, it means normal. The blue is very low obstruction because if you see the steady rise of uh, things to reach the FVC and the restriction where the FVC is very low. So spirometer findings can make you decide whether obstructive restrictive disorder, depending on how your FVC, FEE1, and all of these. And then that's how we make decisions from lung patient, lung functions. Uh, the, also the percentile of FVC and FEE1. FVC, FEE1 are a very integral part of the lung functions. And these are the one of the diagnostic tool for COPD. The criteria of the gold criteria is based on FE1 and FEC, and it's very, very instrumental for diagnosis and monitoring COPD. And this is the combination, as I mentioned, if it's 80 above, then you're in normal, and if it's below 0.78, then that can be diagnostic of COPD. So bronchodilatory respiratory test is very important. Uh, after bronchodilator, you do the test parametry of 1015. If it's increase in 12% of improvement in lung volume, it's, it's a good sign. That means it, uh, you will respond to a therapy. The volume curve is, everyone knows, the shape, uh, which shows this inspiration and expiration. And this is FEV1. And this is your vital capacity. It measures the whole thing. And it's a good pictorial thing when you see this curve looks normal, you know your patient is fine. From a surgeon's point of view, it gives you uh, confidence that you will do a good, good surgery on your patient. And that's why these are visually seeing things. Now, modern ventilator comes with this and you can see it and it shows you that everything is going okay. These are some different curves. The red ones are the actual one and measure to a traditional one. And it shows <clears throat> obstruction to airways. These are variable airway obstructions. This is a fixed one. And this is where you've got a restrictive lung disease. And they're very, very classical curves and you can, it gives you in, good information about it. So I think you measure the volumes and then use with a total lung capacity. And to measure other things, you need inert gases like helium and nitrogen washout to find out what else, like a viral residual capacity and other stuff. So nitrogen washout, gives you functional residual capacity. 
where uh, you have to inhale the nitrogen, then let it go, and then you measure the concentration. These are quite time consuming and we need expertise, but these are the one important part of lung functions. They're done by bigger lab. Similar with helium, and there's a calculation when you take in 10% of helium with oxygen, and then you measure the concentration, uh, and then you get a function residual capacity with that calculation there. So body seismography, as I mentioned, showed you that it's uh, based on your lung movements and measured the displacement of volume and pressure. Uh, there are three different kinds of plethysmography available. The first one is quite unfortunate name. I think none of the tests should have RIP especially, but it is RIP, nobody uses that, but uh, I'll mention it. The other one is, which comes from Hollywood, the optoelectronic plethysmography, and the last one is developed in a good old Cambridge to measure the lung function, assess the lung function. So this is the RIP. Uh, where the sensors are, are upper and lower chest and you make a displacement. They're quite cumbersome. And uh, so I don't think it's gone further from experimental. This is the optical one, which is a Hollywood style where you have a human motion analysis with little spots. It's good for animations and stuff. You see it in games and also animation, but I think it's a too costly for poor NHS to set it up, it takes a time. So the next best thing is SLP, which is non-invasive, non-contact, and then it gives a superb interpretation with 3D modeling. Of course, the software is important. It's called structured because you get a checkerboard sort of projected on your chest wall. I'll talk about it in detail as we go along, uh, but it's a good one. If you can see here, there's a healthy patient pattern and then there's a disease patient pattern. How you can measure it. It can compartmentalize a left and right, a thoracic and abdomen, and you can measure it. It's quite amazing to do. So dynamic volumes are where you do blow things up. Uh, and then uh, you measure about the force expiratory flow between 25 to 75% of FEC. These are all important to diagnose either COPD, restrictive lung disease, and FEV1, everyone knows, even surgeon knows about it. So, and the gas exchange are one which test your lung membrane, where you see the alveolar atrial gradient. You can do it with single breath nitrogen or multiple breath or otherwise helium and xenon or arterial blood gases. These are all to assess how the oxygenation affects in, at the alveolar level. It also depends on the blood flow. The gradient can be measured with these complex calculations and also you can do the uh, ventilation perfusion defect with these. The normal adults around eight millimeters up to 25 millimeters uh, is normal. Otherwise it decreases as age increases. The diffusion capacity is the one we tested, especially to assess people uh, when they have a limited lung function, whether they could tolerate a ventilation or a ventilator or not. And uh, we can measure this with a uh, you can calculate a gradient or you can use a CO carbon monoxide and see the diffusion. And that's one of the good indicator to uh, estimate the uh, membrane function. And CO to be see carbon monoxide, we use it because it's uh, never there in, uh, normally in your lungs and it easily is, uh, affinity for a, a hemoglobin is uh, 200 times. So there is no plasma built up and it's very easy to measure. The DLCO affects with a factor. If you put anemic, it could reduce it. And if you got pulmonary embolism and fibrosis, it is affected. So as polycythemia can increase that because of the increased RVCs. So pulmonary, uh, then cardiopulmonary interactions, this can be done with arterial blood gases. And there are other tests like a shuttle walk, six minute walk, stair climbing and CPAT. My old boss is to say that if you can climb five flights of stair, you don't need a lung function, patients should survive. But I think these are now getting more and more objective before it is subjective. Shuttle walk is routinely done for our TAVI patients and other patients. Uh, and these are quite a useful to assess, especially our older population, where you can see, also measure the uh, oxygen saturation. If it decreases in 4% in walk, 
And if they can't do around 250 meters, you have a problem. Six minute walk is similar. If you can walk up to around 480 meters, you're healthy. If you're less than that, probably you may have issues or you could have a hip problem. Uh, stair climbing, if you kind of climb five flights of stair, your uh, uh, VO2 max is reasonably normal. Uh, but these are all subjective, but they're good criteria to start if you don't have a lab nearby. One of the very effective assessment with whether it's a pulmonary or a cardiac problem, the cardiopulmonary exercise tests or CPAC is a very useful thing. VO2 max is one of the good indicator of a mortality risk when the patients are going through operation. It tells you about complex cardiovascular system, pulmonary system, and a muscular skeletal system. It's a good way of assessing functions which link to each other. And then you classify as class one, two, two B and three, which is uh, to evaluate lung functions. And these are very good test, but you need a good lab to run it, but also they are at effect because you need a technician supervising patients and time consuming. Uh, they are always there, but at present, they are a bit difficult to organize it for all the patients. And the interpretation of CPAT is like, uh, depending on the VO2 max, if it's more than 15 minutes per minute per kilo, you're doing very well. You either assess by cardiovascular limitation, pulmonary limitations, or peripheral And then you can differentiate between a patient has a heart failure or this is because of the lungs and it gives you encouragement to treat the patient the way you want to do. And this is mainly for thoracic surgeon. If you're taking a chopping a part of the lung out, you need to know what you leave behind is survivable for patient. And this is a good way of testing it. Uh, or doing a pre-op FEV1. You got 19 bronchopulmonary segment and that's a calculation you calculate and then you do that is with the DLCO, and then you can assess what you leave behind is keeps the patient comfortable. So I think uh, if you've got a, about 60%, it's a low risk, and you can go ahead with the resection, major resection, if it's three to intermediate, and if it's low than that, you need to do other tests to see whether you can go through it. I think often, if you've got less than 30%, there is, they are a very high risk of having trouble in post operative care. So you should do CPET and see anything else you could do, try bronchodilators. So now comes to the main thing. Uh, in pulmonary function tests in Korea, there's a source of concentration from labs, direct contact, aerosolized, where if you cough, you blow COVID uh, virus into the air and it settles. Saliva, body fluid, and skin contact. There are different ways of spreading things. And people are literally scared. You could see it, we are in a lockdown for the same reason. So uh, it can carry through, if you're going for a pulmonary function test, you can literally, patient can give it to uh, the technician or technician, if he has it, give it to a uh, patient. But uh, that's why there are priorities, there are criteria come through AHA and also from UK, who can get lung functions and who cannot because of this worries. This is a sort of a uh, ATS guideline saying that only in essential uh, and immediate uh, treatment, you need to do the lung functions. So this is a guideline came in America uh, and that has control. And that's the reason not many people are getting lung function because it's quite restricted. You have to gear up into PPE, get the patient in, do the test, then clean everything else, get the patient in. You cannot do that many cases. So you have to prioritize putting through all these issues. And then uh, Association of Respiratory Technicians and Physiologists of UK got their guidelines. They're classified into pandemic phase with high community prevalence where you get a level one safety, then you get a post peak which is we may be not yet there, level two and post pandemic level three. And that's how you classify patients in the era. At present, they are all on a safety one, level one. That means you only prioritize the test. And if you have any symptoms, you're not going to get this test and you have to postpone the routine test. And if you had a test, uh, COVID before, you had to wait for 30 days post before getting this test. 
So I think there are a lot of issues with this, and that's the reason I was thinking about doing the, uh, the talk about SLB. But this is a real issue for lung function for technicians, chest physicians, doctors, all of us, because main source of COVID is from your tracheobronchial tree and the skin itself you do in the contact. So I think uh, pre-COVID thing, I told you all those tests, and now in COVID era, we need to modify it. We need to find different answers. Of course, they may not be a gold standard, but we'll have to develop our own different standards. And that's why we had to look for what are the causing infection in our labs. See, this is the way uh, the labs are assessing. Cough and force expertly maneuver can give you infection. They can be retained there for three up to nine hours. So the droplets are there, small particle size. It makes a threat in our lung functions. The equipment need to be clean. They're all disposable, you have to dispose of, tubing, mouthpiece, everything. You have to clean the lab space. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger issues. And this is not just going to stop when it come finish, when we finish it after summer. No, it will go on at least a year before we know exactly what to expect. So there are different ways, hand washing, everyone says about it, but hand washing has been there throughout. All surgeons know it, we wash all the time before operating and after. But besides that, there is a lot much you could do. And there are different in disinfectants. Of course, the bleaches are very good against this virus. But immunization is going to come and that might just help us more. And you have to do sterilize disinfection. So it, it creates some more hassle and work uh, for our technicians and the lab people and for us because we may not be able to get the test done in the lab. So we thought, what's the new alternative? So non-contact. I think uh, we have non-invasive. That means you don't need to poke something. All also patient just have to breathe. He doesn't have to blow it. Can you imagine, uh, especially old people, it's very difficult to hold something in and blow it. Often you get lung function worried because you hold something, it's blowing up through. Some people who have a stroke find very, very difficult to do raised functions. So I felt SLP is very good in this aspect. This protects the patients because they can just come in a room uh, without, we can have a two meter distance thing and it protects the staff exposing your patient. Less sanitization, that means you don't have to do all these cleaning, uh, but you have to be clean, but uh, things, and you can assess. I'm not saying it's, it is, a gold standard, but it gives you it gives you assessment of lung function. Objectively, you can measure things. So if you look at here, she's exposing all this into here, and that is can cause aerosol. Yeah, somebody has to put a nose clip here, and then you measure these. Uh, and this is usually traditional spirometer. Now we may have to ration this. This is the structural light plethysmograph. Here is the gadget. And here is the person wearing a white T-shirt and then a chest board on his chest. And usually it's between up to 1.1 meter distance. So it already keeps a distance. You could have a glass screen and you can project still through. I think some of my colleagues from the SLP lab knows about it. And this device is called Thorac 3DI uh, because you get 3D impression. It's very quiet. It takes around five minutes of your breathing. It can assess in 45 seconds. But to get a proper reading, you need five minutes of assessment. Each, each test will take you five to six minutes. Can you imagine the amount of tests you will do for routine? Of course, you need a specific test for very, very niche uh, pulmonary diseases. But for this, it's quite good, especially for as a surgeon to assess lung functions. The tidal lung volume, these are all the measurements we do. It has showed like this is an expiratory phase. This is inspiratory phase. And then you can measure the force inspiratory flows to 25, 50, and 75. This is force vital capacity. And these are all the measurements we do to spirometer. I'm showing this because I'll show you how you do the loop with the uh, structural light plethysmography. So spirometry gives you all this, but it's very difficult children. Can imagine children blowing something and, and analyze. Initially, the structural light plethysmography was evolved to analyze the asthma and other lung diseases in children. And that's how the idea came from Cambridge and they developed into this device. The, it's very, very quiet. It doesn't have to force anything and you can get some 
indirect readings which are matchable. It does measure the tidal breathing. It breathes your chest and abdomen, and it can also be a useful tool for you got a respiratory dyssynchrony where you have a problem with the paralysis. You could have an abdomen moving in the wrong direction. These are very, very niche you know, breathing, especially sleep studies. Others. This can give valuable information. But for our routine thing, this is a very good tool. See, I just wanted to show you that flow volume compared to this flow volume. This is a derived measures, okay? This is not in reality, but SLV can give you this volume and it looks like a flow volume. It's measured with some most important parameter is this inspiratory expiratory at 50, which is a good parameter which shows you about the lung functions because it tells you how you breathing out and how, how long it takes and the chest movement with it. You can measure this tidal inspiratory flow, expiratory flow. It's a similar what you do it in spirometry and you can measure it. And I wanted to show this slide. See here, I, IE50 is around 1.27. This is sort of a normal, almost like a flow volume curve. And this is in COPD patient where it took so long. So I, IE50 is around 2.05, so increasing. So it can be sort of gives you interpretation that a patient could have uh, COPD. And this is measured on, a, this is published by one of our uh, participant now uh, by Shannon into journal and which took comparable studies. And these are some measures. You get a graph which shows you the inspiratory time, expiratory time. Then you can do the tidal peaks. And these are the measurements in the total breathing time. And this can give you, you can derive the curves. And it gives, these are all surrogate endpoints from what it does is gives you a tidal breathing but it gives you a lot of information which is useful uh, and to assess the lung functions of the patients. And these are some uh, sort of a thorac abdominal breathing. You can do the patterns like how abdomen, rib cage, and their patterns in different patients. And these are nice to evaluate in people, especially if you've got a post-CABG, often patient don't breathe from chest, they do abdominal breathing. And you can see that difference in those patients. And when they come in six weeks follow-up, you can have a normal breathing resume. So these are good assessment uh, doing the tidal breathings in some of our patients. Uh, and I think uh, this is the principle of structure like plethysmography. You have a little camera uh, ejecting that uh, sort of a checker uh, thing on the chest. And then there are two sensor picks up uh, the movements and creates a 3D die, a 3D chess wall. And then it can move, I'll show you in further and you get a graphic things. It gives you the linear format and then you can get a more derived sort of a uh, flow volume on this side. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's easily manageable. It can be trained to technicians, uh, junior doctors, ourselves. It, uh, uh, the software analysis is a bit more the, there's a unique software which can design. If you see these movements, I'll show you in the video, which gives you a rough idea about the chest wall because of that was my area of interest and that's how I come across this device. This is how it looks. It's a bigger unit and there are smaller unit and still you can see it. This is a sort of a, you can move it around the walls. You can keep it in your a treatment room and can be assessing patients. And this is how you get a graphic interpretations. And this is a larger unit, which you can also do it in paper in a bed. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned, there are two cameras and the projector, and this is how it picks up. They're very, very sensitive and they can pick up every square. These are the checkers. Each segment picks up the movements and then you have a 2D and then you get a 3D impression and it creates a information which can be analyzed for lung function. This is how the graph, you see it on the screen of a SLP, and this is on the graph, and this is a 3D reconstruction showing you how the volumes uh, of the tidal volume. And this is how you will see it on the screen. Uh, this is the chest, abdomen, these are the wave pattern, and you get a graph here with a linear graph, and then you get a flow volume here derived from the values there. So then the issue of a COVID and ITU, because 
we worked in baths. We have a, a whole accepted lot of patients on a sixth floor for ventilations, ECMO, and we had a big brunt of a, all London patients came, and that's why we took whole patient away, or sort of a, kept them away to occupying the Nightingale unit because uh, that was built up for our overflow. And we managed it well, but we realized the decision to make, put someone on ventilator, a different criteria. Most of them are blood gases and how patients behave. My question is, if we can measure the tidal volume, can we make a decision to wait or decision to go in and intubate, whether it's possible? We are discussion, uh, having a discussion with the intensivists, whether it's useful. And some of them showed interest that it's a good, good way of making this objective decision rather than uh, your gut feeling, putting someone on a ventilator, or you just put on ventilator, someone is going to the respiratory arrest, but this gives you that idea. Then from ventilated patient to go to ECMO, how you decide, you've got an oxygenation index to put someone on a ventilator or ECMO, but before that you can do a telltale sign. If you have a device lying in ITU, you can keep measuring things in patients and you can tell you whether they are benefited with ventilator or not and the how to win the people from ECMO, and then how to win them off. These are the questions I'm putting to whole group of you guys to see whether you can find. I personally feel it's very useful, and it's also useful in assessing lung function who left the ITU, like there are so many COVID patients gone home, and they're worried. They're tired and exhausted because of the things they went through, but we don't know what happens to the lung. As you know, if anybody put on ventilator, the alveolar, alveolar numbers reduces because of pressure ventilator. So whether they have a telltale long effects of ventilator or COVID, we can assess them with this device without worry about infection uh, or spreading infection. So there's a lot of questions we have. And I think if I have a time, I'll ask Zamir, I can show you a little brief video. This is from a company. I'm not a promoting it but it gives you a rough idea what it can do in, in sort of a video time. And uh, we'll go on the next slide. This is how the device, you can do it in sitting, lying, and this guy is showing a ZP sternum because that becomes the center of your checkerboard. And then these measurements can be done away. You don't have to be. So patient's contact is almost not there. And that is a good encouragement in present area. If you're looking for solution, to assess patient, this is the best way alternative if you can't do spirometry and other methods. So this is the video I'll, I'll start. And then it has a little Zora gap. Zora 3DI to... is a mobile, non-contact, non-invasive device for ease of use and infection control at the patient location. The clinician is able to assess the patient in a seated or supine position. This reduces patient stress and means that fewer patients are excluded from respiratory assessments. Sora 3DI has been developed using Numacare's Breakthrough Imaging Technology, Structured Light Plasmography, or SLP. This technology projects a structured image covering the patient's chest and abdomen and records movement. Utilizing the NumaView system operating platform and 3D analysis software, the clinician is able to set up, create, and save detailed records for all patients. Because of the screen, there is a slow, uh, but it's moving and they are calculating. So I'm sorry about that little gap. We can see here how the grid size can be set and how the software image captures tidal movement. And this is the tidal movements. Then you can- enhance. Using the unique SLP software, a three-dimensional image is then constructed showing regional breathing correlations between the chest and abdomen. And between the left and right thoracic hemispheres. The 3D reconstruction can be saved, reviewed and replayed, and a PDF report can be generated, saved and viewed.
the recorded image enables the doctor to view the thoracoabdominal chest wall movement, regional movements, left versus right conomid plot, and upper chest versus abdomen. So I think uh, I've finished with my chit chat. Uh, I hope if you're still awake, I can, I can take some questions. This is my hospital, St. Bartholomew's, next to the St. Paul's. I say my hospital is in between the good and then you have the Old Bailey on the other side. So if you're a criminal, you'll be tried there. So it's a good location and there's a meat market next to it. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Shyam, it's Brian speaking. Hi, Brian. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of questions. Um, let's come back to planet Earth. Uh, we haven't got SLP, as you know. I'm sitting in my clinic. I've got a patient with a negative PET scan and a tumor that needs to come out, smokes 40 a day. What do you want me to do? I think uh, when you send it to us, we have this uh, SLP in Bart's. We can easily. So they've got to come to you for assessment now. Is that the issue? No, no. I want everyone to have these gadget in their lung function lab, but at present we don't. So we'll have to. If he needs a tumor coming out, he needs to have a proper lung functions. He has to go through the protocol of COVID. Put a, the technician wears a PPE, patient wears a PPE. They have to wait. We have to do two COVID swaps, uh, and then uh, do a CT, and then go through the lung function for the section. We uh, the cancer cannot wait. We just have to work on it. As a surgery wise, we do it with a full PPE, uh, only intubation where they have a we uh, we go all the way. Uh, the anesthetist with protective PPE intubate them, and once the lung is isolated, they're a bit safe. When you open the chest, it's much better to do the VATS or robotic rather than open, because any opening of a lung you could get aerosol effect. So usually it's better to staple, take the lung out and close the chest. But we can do that. We're still doing it at Bath. A lot of these tumors can be removed through robotic. Good thing about robotic is the surgeon is not directly exposed to it. He will be the console and you can excise the tumor or VATS is also enough, okay? There was an issue about aerosol in laparoscopy where you can be exposed, but uh, we don't use CO2 and the lung collapse naturally. So it's reasonably safe, but of course we have to follow the protective PPA protocol. And I tell you, if you wear that, this is the one time you just want to leave a theater soon. As a surgeon, we like to be in theaters. And we, I think sometimes it's very difficult to get rid of your boss, but here he will leave it first because it's so difficult but we are getting used to it, especially if you want to wear a PPE and the loops, it becomes difficult, but we have. Brian, we still do it, but uh, if we had a PP, uh, SLP, it would have given a better solution. Yeah, all right, but I just, what I'm looking for is a practical pathway. I'm sitting in the clinic, okay, I've seen the patient. Normally I would send him off for lung function, I can't, but I know his tumor needs to come out and we've agreed to do the MDT. What happens next? I think uh, nowadays we still have to go through lung functions through the protocol. Then they come to us. We They have a side room where they are. We do all the tests and then we go through the surgery. So which test are you going to do for him in on we practical swap, terms? We do a COVID swap before they come. They should be in a home isolation. When they come to us, we do swap again. And then after the result, if they're negative, they go through the surgery. And during the surgery, we do the deep throat swap, which is supposed to be almost 90% accuracy and then we perform a surgery. And if they are called positive after the surgery, they get to the full isolation. Too. No, I'm sorry, I, I, I may have misphrased it, but what I'm after is what happens after they leave my clinic, because they're not going to lung function. Are you saying that they need to come now quickly to Bart's for SLP? They can, yes. Not they can, I want to know what to do exactly. What to do is now you have to get a lung function done, either there or with us. <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're talking at cross purposes, I think. Um, because, what lung function will you accept from me? I think we'll have to see if you're doing a major resection, you need to know FEV1, and then that should give us a rough idea. Most yes, often, but if we, 
we've established that I can't do it. So, so what am I to do? Uh, I think uh, they, you can still do it. They have to prioritize. The cancer patients are prioritized now. If you have issues in your clinic, you, you can always send it to us. We can organize it direct. Hmm. Thank you. It was, a, it was a great talk. Is it going to be um, recorded? Yes, I think it is. In a, it's there in a YouTube, I think, eventually. I think Prof Khan is excellent in IT technology, and he's stored all these talks for many of the students to go back and see and us to go back and check it out when we have a time. Well, thank you. It was, a, it was a lovely, lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, Sean, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sean, for a very nice talk. Um, I'm going to start off with a few questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah, perfect, fine. Yeah, okay. So I, I can also see that we've got Cheyenne from Nima Care. So a lot of questions may be directed at him as well, yeah, if he can come in and help us out. So, so the first question, uh, as uh, Brian asked you, is are you suggesting that we... Uh, you know, lose all our equipment and now go down the SLP route? No, no, ne I never said that. This is mm -hmm. a complementary rather than the must because, see, we have not yet established that com we had to compare. We have a lot of tests and studies, but at present we had to make a situation like when you can't go to shop, somebody delivers you food. Similar, if you can't get a lung function test and there's a big queue and patient cannot wait, SLP may be your solution. It will not give you all the things you want, but it gives you enough assessment which can satisfy your anesthetist and yourself that if you go through the surgery in this patient, he will not be at any harm due to anesthesia, surgery itself, and his recovery will be sensible. And that's what I, I'm trying to say. Uh, but there are criteria. Lung function labs are still open, but there is a large queue and the priorities. Uh, every case you want lung function, it goes to assessment and then they can decline or they can accept. So I think it will get better, then assessment will get better, but this should be a, another gadget in the lung function lab. Spirometer, SLP should be a sort of a routinely present because can you imagine if you've got four or five SLP, you can do a 100 hour test in a day it will take away the backlog. So uh, it's a fantastic tool for chest wall, uh, other respiratory issues. And I personally feel it is a, it's a complementary to lung function lab and all the technicians should be on board to use it because it's a solution. Uh, it's, it's a solution for present problem and it could be solution for years to come for it should be complementary to it because as you know, and I know, most of our patients just need a FEV1 or some other more test. So you see the patient is safe to go through surgery. For cardiac, I just want to know this person will tolerate the ventilator and then will come off the ventilator. Of course, we're, we're going to do a trial on COPD to assess COPD progressions and diagnosis compared to spirometry. But these are all studies are going on. But it's a, it's a period, we have a solution. If you can't get lung function tests, this may be an alternative. I'm, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to keep butting in, but I, I'm still very confused about this. Um, uh, it takes a it takes me an hour to get from the North Middlesex Hospital to Barts. Okay, I'm a Barts graduate, by the way. Um, and this is not an easy matter, particularly uh, with uh, public transport and all the rest of it. The way things are, have you actually got a protocol? Um, or a pathway for for um, for us so that we can make sure that we have provided you with everything you need. Yes, I think there is. I think in terms of information. Yes, I think we got a pathway for thoracic surgery. Yes, we do. Or have you got one that we can use in our clinic to send you, you know, without having to, to course, drag I'll, you in? I'll email you our SOP about the pathway yeah. for patients who are going for major resection at St. Bartholomew. Okay, thank you very much. So, Sean, you, you're throwing a visible white light on the chest wall. Uh, the cameras are assessing the movement of the chest wall, and then you are coming up with implied uh, uh, numbers to give us an assessment of lung function. 
in a nutshell, that, that's what the technology involves. Yeah, it's, it's, how it's, it's, does yeah? So how does uh, it affect? How does it reflect in fat people, in women with large breasts, or in patients with pectus deformities? Pectus, I can easily say it. Pectus, it doesn't affect because you wear a white T-shirt. Because that's a to have these checkers and accurate measurements. Often, I think uh, Shine will correct me. We usually give a patient a sort of thin white T-shirt because if you bring some sort of a jazzy with some logos of Manchester United or something, it may affect you. But if you get a clean white T-shirt, wear it, which is snugly fitting on your chest, it gives you a chest movement. These are little little square. The displacement is measured by those sensitive cameras. And that gives you a tidal breathing. And that whole measurements from that gives you assessment. And that's why we need a five minutes. What do you think, so, Shayan? How about fat people? Fat people, it takes time, but it is okay with the fat people. No, is the, uh, correlation, okay. is the correlation of the numbers accurate? That's what I'm trying to understand. It is because ultimately, even the fat people breathe just because they're fat they are not absorbing oxygen from their skin. So when they move their chest, they probably move more. And sometimes you get good images. Uh, I the, have not great uh, experience uh, the scanning reports on the fat people, but Shayan will correct me on that. But a lot of fat people breathe through the abdomen also. I, I am assuming that the displacement will get uh, scattered with the fat. Uh, or with big breasts, and and probably your readings may be erroneous. In fact, I am just assuming. I don't. No, know. I think uh, maybe Shyam can tell us something about it. Shyam, you are there? Yes, here. Um, I think so thank, uh, th Han has a query. I think absolutely. you probably know better about it. Sure. So thank. I, I think I'm I'm for the most part in agreement with uh, Mr. Kolvakar, and thank you for your question, Ali. Um, base. It's it's a very very good question. Um, Historically, we have uh, excluded people with BMI over 40 uh, as an exclusion criteria. And I think the reason for that is uh, the device doesn't work very well if you have folds, num you know, a number of folds in your skin. Yeah. And so that's why you put the white T-shirt and you want some, you want the surface to scan. So that's, I mean, think of it like that. It's a measurement tool and any surface you put in front of it, it can scan. In terms of correlation, I think uh, what you may be thinking is the correlation with tidal volume. The device at the moment doesn't actually, is not calibrated to calculate volume. It only calculates displacement. So, you know, whether you are, you know, more, you know, on the fat side or either way, this, the, your chest and abdomen moves and the displacement will be measured. Uh, and that's what we're working with. And a lot of parameters with, which we measure are not dependent on volume. So you look at timing indices, which, you know, your respiratory rate, these are all, all ratios. These are all independent of uh, your absolute flow and volume. So there is less of an issue there. Uh, what is the sensitivity and specificity of these tests with regards as compared to a standard equipment giving you PFTs? So at the moment, we don't have data on that. Uh, this is something which we are putting a protocol forward and uh, it, it may be done in the near future. Uh, but as a, as, a, as a sort of basic guidance, it's different. So it's, uh, you know, we're looking completely at tidal breathing and pattern of tidal breathing as opposed to spirometry. Yes, it is, uh, you know, your displacement is high, highly correlated with tidal volume, but it's not designed to, it's not in agreement, it's not interchangeable. And we don't have enough data to to support that it, it is it is interchangeable at the moment. Yeah, uh, we as surgeons we we use the ESTS ERS guidelines for operating on patients with lung cancer, particularly with borderline lung function tests. The the uh, the PFTs become a very important medical legal issue for us uh, as as a documentation for us to be able to stand up in court if things go wrong. Would this device stand up to the same scrutiny? Could we use it uh, to defend us ourselves medically legally? If your device says patient is fit to be operated and we have a problem? Uh, I think I can answer that. I think no, yeah. because thing is we are, I think we, are, we have a data enough to prove it. It gives you assessment. It always leaves to a physician to decide it will. It, what you have, as Shan said, is gives you a tidal volume in related to time. 
and that is as accurate as you could get and it's at a normal breathing so and it is in the nice guideline it's also been approved at fda so it's a safe to quote that the assessment which you did but it will not give a full lung function test if you say that you assess the patient on this for some resection and it's fine then it should be okay because it is what is legal is if you cannot use an instrument which is not been indicated in nice guideline or in fda those things and a ce mark we have so you are reasonable but ultimately all the test depends on the assessment done by a clinician so you should be fine if you use it but we have not tested it so good thing about british law is if it comes to it and you get a good lawyer you may test it and it may become a standard of care but at present we won't say hand on heart that this replaces a replacement it only tells you these things and derived volume what we are trying to stress it that this is the at this period of time this may be a better solution eventually with the knowledge and the testing day we may get a such a good data and correlation then of course then we'll say of course it is as good as the gold standard okay now a lot of us on this forum and on the other international forums who are listening in uh, are are people who help set up uh, hospitals set up departments so what is the cost of setting up uh, one device and what is the cost per test okay that we worked out because i did apply for application at our charity so i think uh, it depends if there are vat and other thing but nhs doesn't have to worry about the smaller device cost you around 21000 pound in united kingdom uh, which is a portable unit you can keep it in your treatment room or your own surgery if you're a uh, consultant practicing anywhere i think if i'm a chest physician i'll have this gadget and I'll, and the cost of uh, spirometry is different in different trust and stuff it can cause as high up to 200 to 500 pound but this one with the cost it's a it's a uh, sort of a carbon neutral because you don't print out you get a electronic uh, sort of a uh, report which is emailed to you so you're saved on that plus it probably cost between up to around 15 pound uh, calculating the lease if you get a lease of this machine uh, software uh, expenses so probably pulse test probably between uh, between depending on the volume between 5 to 15 pounds uh for yes are there any disposables involved is there any cost of disposables uh not with this one it's a software upgrade and i think uh, shine will tell us whether upgrade comes with it or not or servicing because uh this is a machine a computer which analyzes so those servicing things probably will come with the company because they are the sole holder of this ip and everything else so that should that we should negotiate when you get it i personally feel you should have both the unit cost you around 50 grand but a portable one is for ward and itu and the large one you should give it to pulmonary uh, test lab yeah hey, and the next question is for shay is uh, do you have uh, licensing for its use in asia i think i think i think shay uh, we can i think it, it is got us it has got a seam up but fda approved but i don't know shine might know okay i i have lost control of uh, of my controls for some reason uh, dr saxena please switch off your phone please we we need to switch off your microphone we need to be able to talk to each other uh, and i i'm not able to switch you off at the moment um, i think he switched off the dave is is off No, something some problem okay so is is it is it licensed for use in asia i, I didn't yeah. quite catch that i think it, it can be uh, we have not tried it. we have we have taken this to mumbai showed it to clinician they showed a lot of interest because they have a lot of child with us the man everything else it should be okay but we need to apply for our indian standard agency to okay it the local one but because we got a ce and a fta it should be reasonably easy uh and uh, because it's non invasive uh, it should be probably easier to apply for uh, yeah because this is a new this will be considered as a new device i mean 
just talking about India, for example, if, if you bring this into the country, this is considered as a new medical device and it will have to go through all the loopholes of the DCGI. And, and that is, uh, that's a long process. So that's why I wanted to know if the company has I think done anything to... Because it's a part of the technology which has already been there around for almost a few years, probably around 10, 15 years. It's not a technology, it's just a device projecting light. So that should be very easy. And I think we, we tested it, we took it to Mumbai, tested it on some people. And I, I personally feel it's easy, but of course we have to go through the local protocol, uh, which we will explore. Uh, it is in the NICE guideline. It is uh, had a FTO approval for certain tests, and it is also a, a, a license to use in Europe. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Sham, I, I have lost control of my uh, of my screen. So Shall please go into the chats. There are some six or seven questions. Okay. If you would be kind enough to just uh, you know take it up. Yeah. Okay, I'll uh, I'll go on the chat. Where is the chat? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, you can see number seven written there. More and seven and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I, if you click on yeah, that, you will get yeah. all the questions up there. Yes, I got a... For some reason, uh, Zoom has frozen on my desktop, on my screen. Okay, no worries. I can see it. Uh, there is a Sandeep Kao. I think they are very positive. I'm just looking through any questions. Uh, sometimes somebody given a message to you. So it's helpful to log out and log on. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, just, just uh, only the questions. If no, just... no, that's okay. I'm just looking for questions. Okay, uh, there are some people. Are... Okay, yes. Uh, there is uh, Natalie Simon. She's my student, and then uh, she was thinking, would it be accurate to measure uh, the displacement uh, from baseline? I think uh, it, it, this device, Natalie, can measure accurate displacement because of the grids line. So that's its function and they can do it well. It, the beauty of this is that you don't have to do or other things. You just breathe normally and can tell you displacements and stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's much easier to do it, especially for old people and sometimes confused soul. Yeah, how many clinical units in the UK are over the world are using this device or is it still just a We got one device in Bath, but that is what landed by the company and uh, we've done some trial on dysfunctional breathings and also for my chest wall patients. Uh, I have uh, got through, uh, through a, uh, the final stage of funding from our trustees to get two of this device. Uh, one is static, but uh, it's in the process. Cheyenne probably know more about the, the thing I think there is device one in Birmingham and other places in there, and there is. Some we've got we've got around twenty five worldwide. There you go. Yeah. Mostly centered around the UK, but we've got uh, overseas units as well. There you go. Okay, fantastic. So uh, I mean, the bottom line is it, it's a very exciting technology. I think there is a lot of scope of use. In clinical practice, uh, all we have to do is work out the, you know, the, get a few more studies in to make sure how sensitive and how specific it is in terms of clinical out, outputs. And uh, in the COVID era, this seems to be uh, an answer for, uh, you know, uh, protecting patients and protecting, uh, protecting uh, the staff from exposure to these issues. Uh, if anybody else has no more, if uh, people have no more questions, then I think there's I'm one question from Taj about yeah. a publication and data device. I think there are quite a few papers we have, and I think what I will do is, uh, Cheyenne has sent me a lot of publications they've gone through. I'll send it to Professor Khan, and then you can collect it, or I send it to IACTS a library, and they can distribute you. Just because you're there today, uh, we have a copy of a PDF copy of one of the cardiac surgery textbook. If the trainees want, just send a request and we can send you the PDF copy. We can send you a PDF copy of one of my book. And then uh, uh, we have applied for CPD at Royal College of Physicians. It's in a process and you probably whoever attended it, if you give us a feedback in the chat itself uh, about uh, just a, even a word sentence, what you did, because that's a requirement for CPD. 
and it, it, it makes us better, as Ali will agree, uh, uh, Prof Khan will agree, that uh, if you give us a feedback, it makes us better. Because at present, we think I'm right, I'm the best, I'm telling you everything correct, and what I say is a gospel truth, which is not true. But you will correct me, you will educate me, you will make better. All of us, as we are teachers, we learn from people who listen to us and tell us. So we see our reflection in your feedback. So if you give us a feedback, all of you, in a single line, it will be useful for us. And also we'll send you a CPD certificate once it's approved. It's one CPD from Royal College of Physicians of the United Kingdom. So Sham, that is very good news. Uh, I, I really applaud the fact that you have applied for uh, CPDs for the uh, thoracic gurus and the IX uh, lectures that we've been doing. This is the 65th lecture of the series. Uh, and uh, may I request everybody to give your feedback either on thoracic gurus or on uh, or, or email it to either me or Sham personally. Uh, Sham has very kindly offered a PDF of his textbook on, on pectus surgery, uh, which is a valuable uh, resource uh, uh, for our uh, academic purpose. And also he's got uh, a cardiac I'm surgery textbook. By for Lawrence Cohn. Yeah, Lord, it's going for all the candidates who are on this uh, educational program. Uh, so uh, please, uh, uh, once this meeting stops, the chat will get uh, erased. So <laughs> that's why I'm suggesting don't do it on the chat. Okay, uh, send us. the message. Uh, yeah, email us personally, and we will uh, we will acknowledge that you have given a feedback, and then we will get you the CPT across. So thank you very much, Sham. It's been great. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed. Uh, listening to this new technology and uh, there's lots uh, for us to learn. From. I think doing this, I learned a lot about lung function for a surgeon. Yeah, you did, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you Namaste. very much, everybody. Uh, Sham, could you just end the show because my screen is frozen. Sure, sure, I'll do that. Okay, guys. Thank, thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah.